Dire Wave. Three. Dire Wave 3.
All right. How's it sound? You sound great to me. Let's make sure that the audience can hear Blessed Father Deacon. Give us a little mic check there, Father D. Check, check. Uh, one, two. <laughs> Perfect. So, one little piece of bad news. Okay. <laughs> the um, it will not let me do two window captures at once. So I'll have to ask our beloved diva Tristana in a future date how she's able to do that because I've been sitting here for a while trying to figure it out and I can't figure it out. So um, I do have my white boy whiteboard present, so I can always uh, you know sketch out something if we need to. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So if you have one uh, window up, which is where you are, uh, it automatic it automatically about- the second window automatically defaults to whatever I add. What if I did this? If I did a share screen, you could try it. Um, could you enable that for me? And then that way I can just go to the article. Let's see, share screen. Just for the participant, which is I. And then it'll obviously block out my ugly face. And then you can look at these logical truths, which is much more aesthetically. Mm. Can you guys hear uh, Father Deacon? Can you hear me? Because it what took me saying? hours to figure all this out to get it to where now I can live stream on the new Mac with guests. If you guys remember, I was always having to use the old Mac. Um, and that one was crappy. And so I needed to figure out how to get it going on the new. So hopefully we have done that. What does that look like? Whoa, that's not going to work on my end. But let me f- see if I can fix that. What okay. What does it look like? Um, try do that again where, where you had it. You're just sharing the YouTube. You're not I'm just sh- sharing the YouTube. I want this. Yeah, that works. Okay. But let me make me tiny. Let me make me small. There we go. This will work. Perfect. Cool. So see the way that. to do this is for you to screen share. Got it. See, that's logic. I just took a series of um, different problems and I basically inferred to a solution that screen share and uh, that <laughs> that was a fallacy. A more, a more like a a Norm Macdonald kind of. <laughs> All right. So, uh, as you guys know, we're going to be covering this uh, pretty excellent, pretty radical, pretty dutical, badical essay that Father Deacon happened upon, and uh, it's an excellent critique of the logical fallacies involved in what we could call natural theology or what we could call um, the classical proofs or uh, which ultimately I think it rests on the notion of classical theism, that there's a generic theism, a generic God, generic principles that we no kind of prima facie or no from uh, an autonomous reasoning standpoint that then kind of we can leap up we can sort of play leapfrog up to there possibly being some kind of abstracted first principle first cause first actualizer um, perfect unity simple essence etc so uh great boomer tech are you serious dude i'm I busted butt figuring out how to do all this stuff to precisely get away from being boomer tech. By the way, can everybody, can you guys tell me if you hear Father Deacon? Well, because you, yeah, how, how, how am I? Do I sound? Nice? I'm going to have to listen to you. They're going to lie. So, uh, yeah. They're gonna, Cause they're going to be like, Oh, I can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. How about that? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you're a little bit behind. So we'll have to verify it myself. That's fine. 
What call oh, you sound perfect. You, fe- you the, sound perfect. Ver- I can't believe See, I got this right. Do you know how many hours it took? I, boomer Tech, you think a boomer could live stream? Are you serious? How many how many boomers do you guys know that live stream? Uh, right? It's like how many boomers you know that uh, are buying Bitcoin? They say the same thing about me, and I'm not Boomer Tech. Like, just because I don't. So I'm a fallibist, a fallibilist when it comes to tech. Um, <laughs> I don't have the infallible chair of technology that keeps me from error. I'm sorry. That does not mean that I'm a boomer. Pope, uh, John, Paul, the iMac. And we ask for the intercessions of our holy motherboard because we, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, um, Yes. So the essay is uh, hefty. It's a, it's a good one. And I have been, of course, uh, deeply involved. By the way, we've got a couple of announcements we're going to uh, make as well. We want to announce your project that has finally come to fruition that, of course, I will be involved with, others will be involved with, which will be the website. Let's get to that in a moment. But um, this will relate to the book that Father Deacon and I both have been reading recently, which is very, very relevant to this yeah. talk today, which is the recently published Dr. Bradshaw anthology of a series of essays with other people like Richard Cross and Swinburne Swinburne. discussing the status of natural theology. What does it mean? What is it? Is it actually even orthodox? What is the orthodox conception? So um, I'm enjoying that book. I'm almost done with it. Uh, But I did have a a nice little excursion uh, side path, side quest to finish Father Deacon's recommended paper. And uh, I always read the papers. I've got big old stacks of papers, and I work my way through them. And I've got all of my Thomistic Sumas all stacked here right beside us, ready to go in case we need to refer to Jay, that. But was I right? Was I right? It was a good article. Oh, yeah. It was actually uh, better than I expected. I thought you were just doing your normal hyping things up, and then I would fall asleep. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, no, I, I didn't think it, was be, it would be as good as it's it actually was. revolutionary. Well, what I've noticed is that it's a it's a better, more formal presentation of a, a lot of the arguments that people in our Discord have heard me and you making for for a long time. Um, it's there's there's critiques that we I've found and seen in Bonson that I've seen in Van Til, but this is stated in a more formal way. So it's not just your kind of average rhetorical presentation. It's actually consistent logical. Um, critiques. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But all of that just to say that uh, we'll be de- I'll be de- having the debate on natural theology from the Roman Catholic perspective, whether we should or should not believe in it. Trent will be in the affirmative. I will be in the negative. And I think that's in, I don't know, three weeks, October 20 something. I don't remember. But that'll all be uh, posted when we're ready to do it. But today will not be full for the audience. We can't show all of our all, we can't hold, uh, lay down all, all of our, our cards. Yeah, yeah, we can't lay down all, all of our mind control tricks. And it's, also, I have a discussion, and I'm not supposed to say with who, uh-oh. at the end of October, um, Orthodox Shahada, Lewis, uh, and Kai's channel, they're going to host me with somebody really big who's going to be arguing natural theology. So it's all been kind of this oh, I know same you're kind of yeah, trajectory. Yes. I uh, just did, uh, uh, Lewis did a wonderful interview. Um, yes. Where we got to actually talk about it. forgot about that. I watched that whole talk. Yes. So it's nice that Jay, you, me, and, uh, you know, we're all kind of working on the same project. We might be talking and, and debating different people, but it's all going the same direction. And it's really nice. Yeah. So, uh, no, that's not actually true to the person uh, full of it in the chat. I have not, fi- uh, literally clicked every work that I've finished reading on Goodreads. So no, I have not only read 46 books. So <laughs> no, you did not have me beat by 2,200 books. That's not actually true. Uh, I quit using Goodreads years ago and I didn't even finish or uh, link all the books. That I mean, we have thousands of books in this house uh, and I've not read all the thousands of books. No, but I have read more than 46 books. But um, anyway, so let's... Do you want me to turn my volume up? They're saying that you're louder. No, I have to do, let me do that on my end so I can make you a little louder and then make me a little softer. Uh, No, no, don't do that. (laughs) Okay. So I've made you, um, how about that? Mine is nice. Man, you guys are really picky. 
Oh, I got to get my audio. Well, I spent, so again, I've spent multiple days getting this right. Uh, Jamie and I were spending literally about nobody like appreciates the hard an work an hour to get the sound, but it's hard to get it right because I know like, between what sh- she and I do or the last person, I don't know that your audio is going to be right because you're going to come in with that, you know, crazy dope screaming audio that you do the beatboxing, the Tourette syndrome, all the stuff that you do when you come in here. So I have to readjust the, the audio. I'm just kidding. You don't have Tourette's. It's just a joke. Okay. I'm sorry. So, uh, let's get to you. Uh, your show that you did with Lewis was great. Uh, I shared it, listened to it. It was a really good, um, presentation of Orthodox epistemology. You got into the different levels and types of argumentation and, uh, then you are going to, you have a new project. Let's talk about that right now. Let's get into the new project, promote it. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So, you know, I've been thinking about this for a year. Um, just seeing all the various talent from many of the, the Orthodox content providers who had the blessing from their priests and bishops to do the work and to see the fruits of that um, and us loosely working together and uh, we're seeing lots of converts and really great work out there and I just started thinking about that you know well especially I think that something that unites us all is that we're not watered down orthodoxy we're not Episcopalian boomer docs, uh, which we all know <laughs> when you go to that PC watered down Episcopalianism, um, try to appease and uh, you know the crowd and find out what's what's culturally hit. Um, I'm afraid to, to say this because people might get offended or get upset. Well as we've seen in the United States, those institutions die because people are seeking a deep, meaningful, timeless truth. And I felt that all of us were bold enough, you know, when we're working to, to speak out. Um, we're not too concerned about what's politically correct. And that this began to what's the the phrase I want to use? It reached those thirsty souls that wanted a deep, meaningful, bold orthodoxy. Mm. And I thought that uh, if we could unite all of our uh, works, because maybe somebody knows about your work, but they don't know David's, uh, Patrick's, you know, Orthodox Shahada. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Sometimes there's some crossover, but I realized if we united all our kind of powers into one consolidated. We're like Voltron. Vol- that's exactly yeah. what. And so I want to, you can see it's patristic. Well, so I, what, what I came up with is it's called patristicfaith.com. And I'm going to be hosting um, quality, top level orthodox blogs. Uh, Abbot Trefin, uh, many people in clergy are reaching out to me. We have a, already a clergy advisory board to make sure that this is, in, you know, up the professional quality as well is in line with the traditional teachings of the Orthodox Church. And we're not afraid to actually speak the truth. And, you know, I have a quote for the page that, let's see if I can get this real quick, pop this up for you. We just hit 80,000 subscribers and there's a guy in the chat saying that the channel is dying. So I guess, I guess we got to quit. We got to, we got to pack it up and quit. I'm done. Let us not. um, I'm trying to remember that. Let me pop up the quote real quick. Let 
to, it's a quote from St. John Chrysostom that we should not about who we not offend. worry ab about offending yeah. our, you know, fellow man if by doing so we end up offending God. Here, let's see. Make sure I got this here. We must not mind insulting men if by respecting them we offend God. I thought that really kind of captured what we're doing. Hard core orthodoxy, the last true rebellion, counterculture, speaking the profound, deep, timeless truths of orthodoxy without a care about PC. Right? <laughs> And so what I want is this site to not only consolidate all of this, but, and a lot of this was tied to Orthodox Montana too. That was to get us all together, to kind of announce what's happening. And it really is a happening. It's a movement that, you know, people are really excited. All these people are participating in it. Um, you, the audience, the subscribers, all of you are giving, you know, wonderful support for this. And, we need this. We really do need this at this time when we're facing so many challenges and modernity and difficult right. things to be able to equip the faithful with good podcasts, PDF banks, videos, articles from scholars and clergy and great content providers commemorating the lives of saints, teaching the traditions of the fathers and not ecumenism and not this kind of liberalism that's coming in and tainting uh, I mean, for crying out loud, people are actually supporting origin, <laughs> get, right? Get away from that. So that's the project. And um, we've got a clergy advisory board right now of four clergy. And yeah, but got... everything that we're doing has a, no clergy oversight and we're just making everything up and we don't even go to church, right? Right. And I'm working with my archbishop and... Uh, we're working on this too, so that it gets the blessing from his eminence. And um, I'm covering all my bases. So all you haters out there, you can't say it. This is quality, quality control. Well, the other thing too, is that a lot of people, uh, well, I mean, in today's climate, we don't know uh, when at any point anybody could be deleted. So yes. the more, um, places that we have out there with good content, the better, because we are in the era of, you know, big time deleting. So that, and the other that thing our, too, is that, we have some really good experts coming on professionals who basically are designing kind of web programs, uh, that will make it, it'll make platforms irrelevant so that you could destroy the platform but you can't destroy the church. The gates of hell will not prevail. You can and hate so the, you that's can hate part the of game, but don't hate the player. Right. Yeah. So, so that's it. We're really excited. It's, okay. you know, I just, it's bigger than Could I you, ever You're really imagine. loud. Could you come down just a little bit? Just maybe one or two notches down. It's really loud on my end. So how's that? Better? Much better. Thank you. It was, it was getting some static there from the loud. So that's it. Pay attention. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Patristic have, Faith. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And I'm going to link the Patristic Faith stuff uh, after the show. Insta I forgot. Yeah, I, did, I did put your... Twitter, yeah. Facebook, YouTube. I put your also. channel and all that in there. But, Thank of course, people you. can find it from Father Deacon's channel. And, and we've all been uh, linking it on our social media this week. But, all right. So, um Let's get to this uh, issue of uh, theistic fallacies and, you know, let's explain, you know, how this relates to natural theology. Um, how do you want to kick this off? I'll let you start it off. Well, here's a man that really wants to get down to it, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, you can talk, if there's something else you want to talk about, I don't care. I just joke it. I was, I was thinking about that David Lynch, the Mulholland Drive with a cowboy. Oh, well, that's, a, that is the cowboy's man. liner. <laughs> man exactly. really wants to get down. You really do want to get down to it, do you? Okay. What is, let's just talk about 
and I don't even know if this author, Dr. Uh, Gererbi, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Hungarian name, from Central European uh, University in Budapest. I, he's obviously not Orthodox, I'm assuming. And so I'm not sure if he's actually realizing the implications of his paper. But for us, like you said, Jay, these are all arguments and points that we had been making, but he had done this in such a succinct and formal way, being a professor of linguistics uh, and philosophy professor, that I was amazed. And I mean, this is the nail in the coffin. This is the silver bullet. And he opens up, and this is great, two quotes, one from James, Thou believest there is one God, thou dost well. The devils also believe him and tremble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's enough, right? We can use the satanic, demonic apologetic, right? I mean. And then the second one is Pascal, who's obviously one of, one of my favorite philosophers. I get my apologetics from demons. I don't know exactly. about you. Somebody's going to clip that. And spread. The other one is... God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. And that really kind of sets the tone for what we're going to actually go into. So people might think, well, aren't we theists, Jay? Can't we identify as being theists? So maybe we should actually start with the idea of what what is theism well yeah he begins the paper by noting that quote theism and by that he means specifically generic theism uh and that's what he, what he means by that is what we're always referring to as generic theism and he calls it a philosophical program right to to argue for the existence of some notion of a transcendent personal god creator governor of the world etc and so this is claimed to be the core Right, core theism or generic theism, essential, the core, yeah, core essential theism in the monotheistic religions, supposedly. That is, of course, the uh, definition of the project that we get from people like Ed Fazer, from uh, Richard Swinburne. Right, these are people who sort of hold up uh, whether they're Thomists in the Orthodox, so-called Orthodox people uh, like Swinburne, or uh, Thomists like. Uh, Ed Fazer, you know, Fazer in his book, he defines classical theism as the god of Plotinus, the god of Aristotle, the god of Averroes, Avicenna, and Augustine, as if those are the same god. So if the rational court doctrine is true, that by the word god, we have this kind of monotheistic and kind of some necessary properties that we all mean, kind of a lowest common denominator. That's what's called the rational core doctrine, and we'll go into exactly what what uh, properties or attributes that would include within their idea of rational core. If the rational core doctrine of the theist is true, then several different things follow. The classical theistic arguments for the existence of God can or do work. So that would be the cosmological arguments, the five ways, teleological arguments, design arguments, ontological arguments, the classical theistic arguments would work. Why? Because as Jay said, well, it's a generic God. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, but the God, uh, and, and Jacob, but the God of the philosophers and scholars. Um, also, the other implication would be, if the rational core doctrine is true, then at least of all three, the, the monotheistic religions, then we worship the same God. So maybe we're not getting everything correct, but ultimately when we're praying, we're, we're, we're worshiping the same entity. It's just, uh, and don't you hear this exactly with what the Pope's saying too? And uh, Jay, you've talked about that too. So now the Pope's saying, uh, Roman Catholics can't, 
attempt to convert people because, look, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, we all worship the same God. So we have, and he states this, if that's true, if the rational core doctrine is true, then the theistic arguments, classical theistic arguments work for God, to prove God's existence, and then we worship, we all, we all worship the same God. What he presents is his case. He states it at the beginning through a modus tollens, which uh, you've heard me use the, the modus tollens, right? The modus tollens is if P, then Q, not P, therefore not Q. So he sets up at the beginning of the paper, this is what he's going to argue. So let's plug in for P and Q. If there is a rational core doctrine, then the theistic arguments for the existence of God can work. Next premise, there is no rational core doctrine or the rational core doctrine is false. Therefore, theistic arguments for the existence of God do not work. That is pretty powerful. I mean, we can in one argument theoretically destroy every classical theistic argument right there in that modus tollens. That's profound. And we haven't even got into it yet. And then it, it would not follow, therefore, it would not be true that all the monotheistic religions worship the same God. And we'll see that as we start to go through. Do you want to add anything to that? Yes. So basically, at the outset, the problem is that the natural theological argumentation assumes that generic theism is the case. This is, however, an unproven assumption and presupposition. So it's a failed project from the outset. There is no simple monotheism that operates as some a priori or more or self-evident or some theory neutral brute factuality by which we can attain this core doctrine. That's right. And he calls that core doctrine the central claim of theism. That's what theism is. So what he's going to do in order to make the modus ponens a, a sound argument that works and destroys theism, he's going to have to destroy, show what, premise two, that the, uh, the religious sorry, the rational core doctrine is false, or the central point of theism is false. And he says he's going to do that in two ways. He's going to look at what's called the theistic fallacy. And that is, the theistic fallacy is the consequence of what he calls, and we'll go further into this non-substitutability uh, of identicals and belief concepts. And then also the, the theistic paradox. And he's going to show that the failure of theism is, to is in the neglect of the special semantic and logical behavior of the central terms and claims like belief sentences within the term God. Now, I know it's a lot of kind of stuff to take in. But I'm just kind of setting up from the outset. He's going to destroy the rational core doctrine. How is he going to do it? He identifies that with the, the central claim of theism. And he's going to do that through the theistic fallacy and the paradox of theism to show that it can't be done. So now we've got a kind of purview of where we're going to go with this. And then we'll see the implications too, further implications. Now, did you like, Jay, that he had that quote from Aquinas? Now, as Aquinas said, one is well advised to avoid bad arguments in theology. <laughs> Since yeah. in a fallacious supporting argument is no support at all. What's more, it discredits the solid foundations, too. And I made, I've been making this point over and over in class, and I made it in Lewis's. It's not about getting to a true belief. Uh, uh, and concluding God exists, or the triune God exists, even. You want to believe something, you want to infer for the right reasons. And as I brought up in the stream with Lewis, one of the problems is 
we all have different reasons. We all have different starting points and they all can't be true. Correct. So that's one thing that I think natural theology ignores. This is like, well, as long as we just kind of get there. Right. And I feel like the middle stuff's like going well, you know, if the argument in the middle isn't bad, but nobody thinks about this kind of the presuppositions and starting points. If your starting point is bad, your whole argument's bad. You have no good reasons to get to the actual true conclusion. But everybody's starting points are different. Is that the peripatetic starting point? Is it uh, a priorism? Is it, you know, you know what I mean? There's all this stuff that, and so this will be, that's what he's kind of uh, talking about too with the uh, Aquinas quote, avoid bad arguments in theology. Why? Because a fallacious supporting argument is no support at all. Good point, Aquinas. Sometimes Aquinas does get things right. There is one. Um, we're also going to see religions cannot share a common nature due to the special behavior of the term God. That was kind of what I already said. But let's go in, and I can share the screen if you want, where he's actually going to talk about and define what he means by theism. And guess what? He quotes Richard Schwinburne, who is a huge supporter of natural theology in the very Western sense. Correct, Jay? Yep, I'm just trying to make sure the audio is correct. Everyone's bitching about it, so... Are you kidding me? No, that's it's always an issue. So, so I mean, I've got it as best I can, part, but it's not. I mean, it should be good enough. I, you sound fine to me. I mean, I played on my phone. What? I can hear you clear what? as day. So I don't. I don't know what the problem is. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do something real quick. I'm gonna look. At... No, it's not on your end. Don't please don't change your end. No, no, I'm going to listen like you're doing on the YouTube and see if we have a bunch of liars in the chat. Dang. I, don't, I mean, people come and talk about the stupidest garbage in the chat, so. All right, uh, yeah, so a couple points I wanted to make was that, um, so, Perfect. Can, you, can you not do that, Father Deacon, please? Because it's just echoing. I just wanted to check and make sure. Don't worry, I'll take care of it, don't worry about it. Um, so. You got it. Okay, let's go. So if he says that, uh, so I just finished the the, the Rada Galwitz book on uh, Saint Basil arguing the Cappadocians arguing with Eunomius, and one of the things that comes up in that book is how insistent that Basil was on the fact that when we name God, we're really naming the Triune God. There's no mm -hmm. there's no other route to knowing and naming and having conceptual. Uh, content that refers to the Christian God other than um, going to the, the Trinity, right? So when we predicate of God, we're speaking of the person of the Father and by extension, the Son and the Spirit. And that's why you see the Cappadocian so often saying, I can't conceive of the one without quickly being moved to the three. I can't conceive of the three without quickly being moved over to the one. So does that make, does that make sense? Yep. So if that's the case, if that's the case, then as I was reading this paper, I was just thinking about how absurd it would be to read all of that, to read the works of St. Basil and then come to the conclusion or think that, oh, actually, Basil and Eunomius are arguing for the same God. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, we've always. No, the, the, there's thousands of pages spilled by the Cappadocians to point out that. The theism of Eunomius, which is a generic Unitarianism, is not orthodox. There is no, there's no common ground there in the sense of systems, right? Exactly. And we've been making that argument for a while now. So I'm glad to see that, again, God is Trinity. As I said, that, that is who God is. So you can't, as he'll point out in this article, that cannot be substituted with uh, a generic theism. Yeah. Um, we see, for example, that Aristotle is called a heretic by St. Basil and Hexameron II. And 
it's not just that, well, okay, but he got some things right and some things wrong. That's true in this in one sense, but when it comes to the uh, salvific knowledge of God, when it comes to what we're actually after here, right, it doesn't work to try to make arguments that are premised on a faulty epistemology. If we don't believe that there is actually, in fact, uh, neutral ground, that there is generic theism, th then both of those things are not going to work, right? They're both going to, they stand or fall together. And so if, if generic theism is premised on there being neutrality, which is the case, right, then... This is starting to piss me off here. The audio. It sounds good. Don't li don't listen to me. Um, uh, so anyway, so let's get to uh, Richard Swinburne um, because okay, let, he let kicks me off that screen. Yeah, he kicks quick. off with uh, his definition of the project of generic theism or um, what's he call it? Theism. He doesn't call it generic theism. He calls it what? Theism corollary. Let's see. Do you see the page four? Yeah, page four here. Yeah. We so call here... this one S for one yeah. Swinburne. Right. You'll notice the H will be for Ick. Okay. And as we go down, um, I'm gonna look up. That is from Coherence of Theism, uh, Swinburne's book. He states, "By a theist, I understand a man who believes that there is a God. By a God, he understands something like a person without a body, i.e., a spirit." who is eternal, free, able to do anything, knows everything, is perfectly good, who is the proper object of human worship and obedience, the creator and sustainer of the universe. And as we see, we will go down um, to, uh, he'll, he'll break these down into actually a whole list of premises, right? I think he calls them D and C, right? Like there's like seven and then eight, nine. So that's a good that's a good definition right there of what theism would be. And, and supposedly that should be, as he sees here in the second paragraph, well, that should be common understanding um, once you add kind of the monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That should all fit, correct? Okay, so Christians, Jews, and Muslims are all, in a sense, theists, according to Schwinburne. So that's 2S. Third premise. And this is the essential doctrine. Many theists also hold further beliefs about God, and these Christians, Jews, and Muslims differ among themselves. Yet, further beliefs in which some members of each group differ among others. Sorry, that's not the core doctrine. That, that'll become important though. Um, he perceives this difference is it in terms of core as far as addition. So what that means is the assumption here is there's a, a lowest common denominator, a core. How do I account for differences? It wouldn't be a difference in the core, but additions to the core, correct? Right. And and then Jay, you can talk about this because I thought you had some good points. Here you have John Hicks, the famous perennialist who and a professor of religion. And what he states he puts the, the author of this article puts into a premise called four H for, for Hicks. Premise four from H Hicks. So in other words, between ourselves and God as God is in God's ultimate transcendent being, there's a screen of varied and changing human images, not graven images, but mental images or pictures or concepts of God. He calls this the veil. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that's going to be important. Right. So this would relate to um, the whole project of natural theology. And as Dr. Bradshaw says, there's a, a, a clear connection between the project of natural theology and absolute divine simplicity. And of course, if what we're knowing about God is all creaturely uh, signifiers, it's all 
reasoning about uh, creaturely causation or, cre or or this creature's relation to that creature, then we're never actually getting to the thing itself. We're only sort of using uh, creaturely analogies, right? And we find this, for example, in Thomism, that literally even in the life of grace, according to the Thomist, you're actually only still operating and, and interacting with created realities. You're never actually in this life touching on the thing itself because that would be reserved for the beatific vision. And there's no beatific vision in this life. Hence why there's no uncreated grace doctrine there. There's no uncreated energies. There's This is, again, the debate between St. Gregory Palamas and the Barleyamite. And so this is, again, why the anthropology directly relates to the, the theology. Uh, if you don't have the doctrine of the noose, if you don't have the doctrine of the uncreated energies, then you don't have a clear way to name God. And that's precisely why Basil says in letter 234 against Eunomius that what we name is the energies. Those are the actions, attributes, powers of God that come down to us, St. Basil says. And so the, the analogia, the naming, is the naming of those energies and not the divine essence. This is the basic you know, point of the essence. And Jay, that's a, that's a great point too. It's the point that we always make that there's an immediacy with God. There literally is divine energies in which we're naming, as you pointed, are the breaking in that we don't have to be mediated to the transcendent monadic God through um, a series, a, a causal, a causal chain, a created causal chain that I can only access. Can you please back up a little bit? It's, it's really, it's like overpowering and, and it's, it's all, it sounds like static on my end. How about, so it I'm, was fine I'm, the way it was just don't just ignore the trolls in the chat. They're just, trying to trip us up it's probably a bunch of roman catholics who are mad that we're doing this but okay I'll <laughs> ignore let uh, me start over so ahead. it proves the point that again there's the energies give us immediacy with god so that we don't have to be mediated through ideas um or through a created causal chain that's only accessible to our ideas and only if that's true if i can actually build a philosophy about causation that's actually true um from an autonomous point uh, view I actually can't so what I thought was interesting about Hicks argument was his veil argument illustrates the flaws of natural theology because what does he say we're all just we're all just behind this veil and we're constructing these different images and phantasms yeah this right? is why Thomism and the the yes. natural theology project leads to the same positions of perennialism what Hicks says is precisely what sounds like what Vatican II says, right? That the, all the religions are just kind of aiming at the same generic thing, right? This is why Vatican II says Hindus worship in love the same God as we do. Islam is worshiping the same God as the Christian. We're all worshiping the same God, even the, even the Hindus. So for Vatican II, it's not even monotheism that's the uh, so-called lowest common denominator core requirement. But again... Uh, I like the fact, I want, before we moved on to uh, that, he notes that the core doctrine, the, 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 this idea of a core theism or generic theism, it actually presupposes the very thing that's in dispute, right? The very thing that's in dispute mm -hmm. is that we're naming and correctly identifying this God, but this God is not the same amongst these yes. monotheistic faiths. And so, for example, when it mentions things like the personal God, if you know the history of the dispute, as I said, between the Cappadocians uh, and Eunomius, then you know how crucial the doctrine of the personhood of God is and how much dispute there is and how, many, how much ink is spilled over what it is to be hypostasis or person. And in fact, the Thomists uh, do not get this right. They're actually more in line with Eunomius. So the idea of Swinburne, who is going to come to the table with a generic theism doesn't even realize that he's actually presenting things more like Eunomius than what the Cappadocians said. So imagine, just th think of the absurdity of this. Oh, let's do our apologetic in union with Arians and Eunomians. But then when we get to theology, they're heretics without grace. I mean, it's just yeah. absurd. It's, it's That's so stupid. That's a wonderful stupid. argument. Uh, Swimmer, where did you get that? Well, <laughs> funny thing, I actually ran into this heretic the other day, and he actually said, um, 
but he's a heretic. Um, so there's a kind of inconsistency that I'm saying. But it's not just an inconsistency of like, uh, oh, you're, uh, you know, haggling over some theological minutia with Eunomius. No, it's not a minutia. It's the very Trinitarian doctrine itself. And so how could there be a common apologetic between, a, how could Basil and Eunomius be on the same side together against, I don't know, Richard Dawkins? It doesn't make any sense because Eunomius is not going to have the right doctrine or the right it's it's he's fundamentally flawed such that he's excommunicated and called a heretic so how is he going to be arguing for the same god it's not and and, and if, i think they all originate from origin genomius what do they all do i would say they all start with this kind of autonomous epistemology this this embracing of kind of greek metaphysics and the ability that oh from these made up literally made up principles and stories that i'm making i can actually do all this stuff is it any surprise that they actually get to heretical conclusions when you say made up story what do you mean i'm actually saying that when somebody says the first principles of that you can go through a series of cause and effects or the peripatetic axiom right to me when i reread these kind of first principles ontological principles medical physical principles they're not revealed by the to the philosophers they're made up they're stories <laughs> well let me just say like we always say just grant me my whole story jay and then i can actually prove my case they can't function as epistemic starting points right because they're viciously circular and arbitrary and i think this is ultimately the problem because even notice in what hicks is the veil argument mm -hmm. um and even with the author the rational core it's pretended autonomy that I can start with my mind and then I could ground all this stuff as legitimate accounts of knowing a part and a denial of revelation. That's why he starts the article, the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham is not the God uh, of the philosophers. And so it's that fundamental, it may seem like a small issue at the beginning, but Every heretic embraces the, this Greek metaphysics in this type of philosophical It's project. the autonomous project. The it's autonomous. the project of autonomous reasoning that I can build a system from my head. I don't need revelation. I don't need God. I just need my mind functioning as it is autonomously yes. like a tabula rasa to construct a system. And that's why Hick is actually consistent and the mm -hmm. rest of them aren't. If that were true, you're literally behind the veil and you're creating, as he says, images that maybe they attach to right that you're hoping but everybody's different so either what's the conclusion they're all wrong or they're all right hick text that's all right but guess what it denies yep that the transcendent god breaks in and reveals himself the god is the lord and he is revealed yeah, this himself. is what i've said so many times phaser in his chapter on neoplatonism says we can appropriate the neoplatonic arguments because there's an, a great uh, presentation, he says, of the one being eternal, timeless, and unable to... He couldn't be in time because he would be subject to change. Oh, so you're arguing for a thing that excludes the incarnation. Good job. That's a great apologetic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. let, let me give... Can I give you another point, too? That, yes, uh, please. So something I've mentioned many, many times, uh, which is that... It, which he actually brings up, right? So he actually says, wait a minute. Um, on what basis is it known that there are primary categories or attributes or properties of God that we kind of know right away from our reasoning process, as opposed to the secondary categories, which are somehow in a lesser known, unclear status? This is arbitrary. And this is something I keep pointing out. On what basis is it that when we supposedly are doing our autonomous reasoning, we're able to come to the conclusion that God is a perfect unity he is a perfect simplicity. He is a perfect, I'm just using some of the examples, uh, a, a quote, first cause. He is a uh, pure act and, and that he acts and therefore it, the omnis and that he is quote personal. Wait a minute. So these are in Sw Swinburne's list, right? I don't think he uses act, but he just says attributes. So I can use pure act. It's another one of the things that supposedly right in the uh, 
the Natural Theology Project. But uh, on what basis then is Father Logos tri Triad, right? These other names? On what basis are these in the second category? It's arbitrary. In other words, the thing that the because that then the natural theology project person, the generic theism, person, oh well, it's evident that these are known by reason alone, and these are part of faith. Uh, really? So you can approach God apart from Father? Really? But how is he personal if it's not Father? Do you see that these are not prima facie, self-evident, or uh, first category? names of God that you know through human autonomy and these are secondary that's arbitrary and by the way there is no theism that says that you know God uh, uh, there's no Christian there's no orthodox Christian theology that says that you know God apart from father first and foremost mm -hmm. so do you see why that doesn't work father deacon do you, do you get my I argument my point here I thought yeah, I, was, I thought you were talking about the crowd. I was waiting for the crowd to respond. Do you guys see? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and that's just a perfect summary of uh, pretended autonomy. Um, how ridiculous it is. So if, uh, if there's not a... Um... On what basis then is triad or God the Father a secondary category of things that we know or name about God that are not part of the core? In other words, Swinburne's list is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's not consistent either. Because and he says that too. It, yeah. it, it's uh, it's circular. It's remember, I mean, how many times have we come across this? Well, just grant me it so I can make my, without justifying it, so I can actually prove my case. Now, wait a minute. If these are arguments for the existence of God, we're not going to grant you all these things. <laughs> oh, just <laughs> grant me my argument for God's existence, and I'll prove to you God's existence, right? So um, why don't people usually call this out? Because they might agree with it, or it sounds good. But I'm starting to notice that, that people don't put the question mark down looking for justification far enough. Well, yeah, that kind of sounds good. I, I believe that about God too. So, and then they just they just stop there, which is to actually say that I'm granting you your arbitrary premise so that you can make your uh, your your argument. I, I don't need you to justify anything anymore. I just. Yeah, let's move over to uh, page five, if we would. Okay, let me just share real quick um, just where we're at because it'll, it'll get us right into five. I wrote some notes on this, and this will be helpful. What have we seen so far? To recap, premise one defines a theist. Okay, this is using Swinburne. Okay, eternal, free, able to do anything, knows everything, is perfectly good. A uh, person without a body, I a spirit, proper object of human worship, obedience, creator, and sustaining the universe. Premise two, Swinburne, Christians, Jews, and Muslims are all in the above sense theists. So he's connecting these. Premise three, many theists also hold further beliefs about God, and these Christians, Jews, and Muslims differ among themselves, and yet beliefs in which some members of each group differ from among others. Remember, that's the additional clause. The core remains the same. Their differences just can be explained by adding things to the core. Then premise four from Hick. So in other words, between ourselves and God, as God is in his ultimate transcendent being, there is a screen of varied and changing human images. That's enough and I count for the differences, not graven image, but mental images, pictures, or concepts of God. Okay, here's the important part, and this is going to get us to page five. The central core claim of the theist. Theistic leap that God exists and that there's one God. We would all believe that. S the theistic core premise too, the monotheistic religions all believe in the same God. What he wants to see, does it follow from 5CC1, 6TC2? And that's what we're going to actually get into. He's going to say no, simply from that fact and the above premises, you cannot 
make an inference, a valid inference to 6TC2. Sound good? Yeah. So page five. Let's go. Okay. I'm on page. There, I just explained page five. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Because then we're going to go to six. Yes, because um, on page five, I did want to read this quote about the veil that we mentioned yes, earlier. Yes, please and do. That was a great Notice quote. the similarity between the natural theology project, the generic theism project, the autonomous reasoning assumptions, and Freemasonry. He says, a first significant corollary of the theist view can now be noted. This corollary would have that no religion can lay more claim to truth than the others on issues that go beyond the so-called core doctrines. Now, this is a perennialist, right? This is Hick. Mm -hmm. This must be especially so for Hick, since every religion is on the same inner side of the veil, and the veil is what prevents us from getting to predicating and picking out the particular proper God that we're after here, right? The peculiarities are all appendages to what is rationally approachable. So the Trinity, right, specifics, the 99 names of Allah, those are peculiarities or appendages or the accidental aspects of religion that specifies Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as opposed to the so-called core doctrines, which are, again, totally arbitrary and uh, circular. They are assuming the very thing that they're there to prove, right, which is what we just saw. How do we know that God is... Uh, a unity, a simplicity, a cause, a pure act, the omnis and personal, but he, we don't know about father, logos, triad, etc. Right? That's that's a problem. And so the uh, other position, the opposite position, this position of the natural theologian, the perennialist, the so-called generic monotheist, he goes on to say. The peculiarities of the of these religions are the appendages to what is actually rationally approachable. But these are the but these the peculiarities are for decorative purposes, as all of these three religions result from the additions to the one core that is established by reason, the autonomous reasoning project. They can also be equally false, and for the same reason, they can thus be equally true. Mm -hmm. So, if all of these, if Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have a core religion, then it's not actually Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's the core religion that is the real thing. And these three are actually false because they have the appendages that are not the essence of the thing. None can be completely true, he says. So isn't that amazing? And then it can also be equally false. Yeah. It takes, just like what we do with David Hume or Peter Singer, it takes somebody like Hicks to show that this, Hicks actually being consistent. We can actually use Hick the way that we use David Hume, yeah. even Peter Singer, even though we don't agree with Hick's position, to show he actually consistently arrives to the a correct conclusion. Either they're all equally false, um, or they're all equally true. Yeah, if you're if you're if you believe in generic theism, that should be your conclusion, and that pick either, pick which other one one you want because they don't matter because they're stupid. The religions are dependent on the contingent historical circumstances, and they evolve accordingly, according to Hick and his perennialist view. And thus, it is only the reasonable uh, core, which is the lasting and necessary uh, thing that we're arguing for and reasoning to, right? And how Masonic does that sound? Does that not sound like Freemasonry? Well, of course it does, because it sounds just like the perennialism, right? But Because they have a false assumption that you can reason to God's unity, God's simplicity, God is first cause, God is pure act, God is the omnis, God is personal, apart from Trinity, apart from Jesus. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. Again, go read Basil versus Eunomius. Generic theism is thus predicated on autonomous, neutral reasoning, that there's neutrality, that there are generic, self-evident, or more evident attributes of God that we don't that we come to apart from revelation. Somebody, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, so I just wanted to add those points. So now we're ready for uh, page six here. Here we're going to get Swinburne's arbitrary list that I've been talking about. Okay, so on this, just to make it more visibly uh, pleasant, I'll just share the, my notes on there. 
So we're going to call it, the, there's the central core theist belief and then the corollary, and it's not going to follow. Okay, so everything that we've said so far can be summarized in these main points, and this would be Schwinburn's position, and by default, any natural theologian or, yeah, or, or exactly. Theist. And this, by the way, remember, this applies to the natural theology of all three monotheistic so-called religions. So these yes. these ref refuters refute the natural theologians in Islam, the natural theologians in Rome, and the natural theologians in the Protestant realm. Yes. There is a God who is, that's 7a, 7b, omniscient, omnipotent, eternal, free, good, creator and sustainer of the universe, a person, the theist God is worthy of worship and obedience. The theist God is the same for all monotheistic religions. And he's specifically going to show these two, 7D and 7E, are incompatible. Um, but all of those are necessary in order to have this, which is the central core of the theistic belief. Remember, you're plugging in that God exists, that there is a God. Well, what is God? 7A down to 7E. Yeah. So if you can show that those two are incompatible, uh, mutually exclusive, then you can't actually make the jump from 5CC1 to 6TC2 which is exactly what we want to show that the monotheistic religions do not believe in the same God. Yeah. Well, you, I want you to keep going. I'm going to actually grab a couple of books while you're talking because they illustrate these points. So go ahead. Okay. So notice here's some notes that seven a through seven D constitute the claim of five CC one. What's the claim five CC one, the central core of theistic that God exists and there's a God. So, all of this constitutes 5CC1, which is basically what I already said. Um, and we're actually going to see that because the term God is not rigid, and I'm going to tell you about what that means. God is not and he lowercases God because God capitalized gives the appearance of what's called a proper name, which in philosophy of language and logic would be known as a rigid designator. That it denotes one entity and only one entity across all possible worlds, such that that entity could be substituted into any claim. Now, substitution substitutability of identicals is necessary for the uh the theist why if because he's going to make this claim here if god means 7a through 7d okay then if that's a if common core is true then i should be able to substitute the same god for islam christianity and judaism right okay but that's only if it's a rigid designator that's a proper name and he's going to argue that uh the term god is not a rigid designator since it can mean different things in different possible worlds just as jay said god means something different for aristotle arrows aquinas Aotiana, etc and he's going to develop arguments that there is no such identifiable, identifiable individual that would qualify as a single referent of the term. Or there are as many as there are describing a certain entity. The term God is therefore what we call in logic and philosophy of language a flaccid designator, even for monotheists, which could pick up different values in different religious frameworks. And what he's going to argue the author of this article is that it only becomes a rigid designator and i'll explain a little bit more what that actually means 
in light, so a rigid designator is picking out an identifiable entity and only that entity, such as there's only one. Because notice the monotheists aren't going to say, oh, well, there's multiple gods. No, there's one god. Okay, so what is it about our names and properties or thoughts that actually hit what we call in philosophy intentionality? Hit the object of intention. Your sense and then your reference. And you're referring and hit it. Okay, so... Let's see, what else should we say about that? <laughs> Proper names, like Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias, J. Dyer. There's only one of those, right? I mean, even if somebody took on another name, the notion of a proper name is that it's identifying. And Saul Kripke goes in um, Naming and Necessity, his work, he goes into this. Let me give you examples of rigid designators. So they're identity statements. And identity statements are going to be important to this argument because what the thesis want to it needs to do is to make a substitution in order to validate the claim that all monotheistic religions believe in the same God. Regardless if there's additions, right? It's just, it's the same thing. It's just, there's other stuff on that. Well, if that's true, if there really is a core theistic belief, a central doctrine, then you can substitute that across the board. It's just, you're getting uh, what do they call it? appendages, right? Or what was the, the other phrase that he used? Uh, uh, accidental little, qualities. So just accidental qualities. And maybe you got that wrong. Maybe you described something about Jay Dyer that um, it isn't actually true that he has red hair or something like that. But we're, we're still hitting the same entity. Um, that would be true if and only if j dyer is a rigid designator and it's a rigid designator because it's a proper name so whether you know that or not so the typical example is samuel clemens and mark twain you might say give a different list about samuel clemens like samuel clemens is like this and and mark twain's like this but because those are proper names the sense refers to one and the same referent such that you can say Samuel Clemens is Mark Twain. The other example is the morning star and the evening star, Hesperus and Phosphorus. Those are not flaccid designators. They're not properties. And you say, well, what is the more, uh, what is Hesperus? And you start to describe the morning attributes. It's in the morning, it's located this, then phosphorus, that it's the, you know, evening, it's located in a different, so you have different senses, but Hesperus is phosphorus because they're proper names. Whereas, so what does that mean? Once you discover that, that's what uh, Saul Kripke calls a posteriori necessity, you may not know that, but Hesperus and Phosphorus is Venus in every possible world because it's a rigid designator, as opposed to, um, I don't know, give me, George Bush is the, what, what president is he, the, what number? George W. Bush. 666th president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, Let's see. Let me just type it in real quick. We just George, George W. Bush Bartok, tear down those rigid class of designators. Okay. George Bush is the forty no, the forty first president of the United States. Okay. The forty first president that sense that description 41st president of the united states is a flaccid designator 
it happens to refer to George W. Bush, but not of logical necessity. Could have been something else. So notice, rigid designators apply to an entity in every possible world. There could have been a possible world in which uh, I, I, somebody else got the presidency, and therefore the description of 41st president. So it's a, it's a flaccid designator, it's a non-rigid designator. George W. Bush is George W. Bush in every possible world. Samuel Clemens is Mark Twain in every possible world. Hesperus is Phosphorus in every possible world. That's because they're proper names. Okay, now that's a lot of fluff, but what am I trying to say? Well, this is important because is the term God a flaccid designator, a non-rigid designator? Or is it a rigid designator? The rigid designator. It is flaccid. It is non-rigid. Yes. If it's a rigid designator, then the theist is actually true, and we can substitute, and we're all worshiping the same God. Yeah, but I mean, we're going to go through some arguments. Scripture today. itself tells us it uses the word in many ways, so we know it's not rigid. Right. And we're going to go through some detailed arguments. Hopefully, I didn't lose people on the kind of heavy-duty philosophy, but it's actually important. Um, if not, you can um, pay for Jay's other second half, where we'll explain the mysteries. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Here is something interesting, too. Let me share this. And He says... It's not clear whether that list, 7B, 1 through 6, and 7C, is to be understood as a long conjunct. Now, what a conjunct in philosophy is, is like this, A um, and B and Now that has a particular truth value that's going to be different than this, A and C and. <coughs> that's basically what he's saying there is that, well, how are we even supposed to take this list? Because for example, right? Do we take it like this in which there's one truth value or I change that and the truth value is going to change? So is it all together and then an addition of something or all together? That's what he's saying. And that's actually gonna become an important thing. Okay, but here's the theistic paradox clearly stated. 7D, it does, so he's gonna say, it doesn't matter. Just kind of an interesting thought. How are we gonna take that? Maybe that's something we could come to later. But the fact of the matter is, here's the grave error. 7D and 7E are mutually exclusive. 7D states the theistic God is worthy of worship and obedience. Yep. 7E, the theistic God is the same for all monotheistic religions. And he says, if it is the case that a monotheistic God demands obedience, which is only meaningful if the demands are explicitly specified by laying down certain requirements, yes. rules or laws, this is the paradigm relative. And the demands are particular to each religion and Islam's yes. demands are not Christianity's demands. Islam's yes. demands are mutually exclusive to Christianity. Christianity's demands are exclusive. They're, they're, uh, there's no commonality in terms of whether yes. you can do the same things for Islam, the Trinity is shirk. For Christianity, Islam is totally heterodox, Aryan. So yep, this and that's is what he says. Obedience yeah. to one law excludes commitment to the other. Yeah. When, so what do the Ten Commandments say? Can you have other gods? <laughs> no. Yeah. So consequently, seven D cannot hold. Or conversely, if the case the theist God is the same for all monotheistic religions, then it can't demand a special allegiance, right? Yeah. Since allegiance implies special requirements, therefore, 7E cannot be maintained. They are mutually incompatible, but that is necessary for the theist to actually make that argument. Yeah, so, so if we're going to be natural the we're going to be natural theologians, don't try to make me a Christian. Yeah. It doesn't work. 
Um, that is the first kind of knockdown argument that he has, wouldn't you say, Jay? Absolutely. And he's just gonna he's gonna give one after another. So what we've done so far is just set up what is and the theist argument. Can I, I want to can I give some examples to hammer this home that this is not just some abstract paper, right? If we were to go to the top Thomist out there, or the pop Thomist, the guy who makes it, you know, right? If we go to Ed Fazer's book, Five Proofs for God, he says, for example, early on that the arguments for God's existence in his book or in Thomism, Roman Catholicism, they're all grounded on self-evident principles, foundationalism. And when asked about, well, how do you know the self-evident principles are actually true? His, I'm not joking. His argument is that he says they are, quote, completely general. Well, we all know that they are. That's literally his argument. And then he goes on to say, and therefore I'm going to argue for a one- a generic one that is completely change that is totally changeless and immutable and cannot be in time and space. If he were in time and space, this would entail him undergoing change. That's Phaser on page 75. Okay, so this God that you're arguing for cannot incarnate. If he were in time and space, according to you, he would change. And therefore, the one that you're arguing for is completely non-incarnational. He cannot incarnate by definition. So Phaser wants me to, to accept all this argumentation that's autonomous and inconsistent. And then when I accept those things, down the road, he'll tack on to it the things that are proven by faith, Trinity, incarnation, Jesus, resurrection. But you just argued for a, de a deity that cannot incarnate, and now you want me to accept the incarnation. Now, again, to stress this point, when he goes on to uh, flesh out in the chapter on Thomism, what is the Thomistic proof? Well, this God is identical to his essence. He, now we've brought in personhood, is identical to his essence. All of his actions are identical. So he literally brings in the modal collapse stuff, right? And he says, we know all this from empirical sense data on pages 122 and 23. I'm not joking. This is not, we're not looking at the Bible. So number one, I'm not sure how we've gotten to he, that it's a personal God. That that's never treated on. That's never touched. That's just assumed. He just is his existence. He is his essence. He person is nature. Okay. That's the number one error that the Cappadocians point out in eunomius so he's we're literally saying that eunomian argumentation will get us far enough just accept eunomius's presentation and when you get the the idea of a generic unity from empirical sense data by the way and how do we know that the empirical sense data principles are true well because everybody accepts them as true on page 74 that's what phaser says they're completely general well, you know, we seriously got to start making some t-shirts about Okay, hold, hold on. It gets better. Okay. It then he goes on to say that, the listen to this. The, I want, this is what really hammers this home. Who, who, according to Dr. Fazer on page 190, is he arguing for? For reasons like the, these, all of these proofs, proofs that he's given, the mainstream of the Western tradition, in terms of philosophical theology, Okay, there is no unified, quote, Western tradition. There is no coherent idea of philosophical theology, I'm arguing. Whether it is the pagans, like Aristotle and Plotinus, or Jews like Maimonides, or Muslims like Avicenna and Averroes, or Christians like Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas, we have always insisted on divine simplicity, as a non-negotiable element element of the sound conception of God. So all of these people have a sound conception of God. We go to all of these people like in some sort of like Mount Olympus, uh, co like a confederation of the world religions. Oh, uh, please, Maimonides, Aristotle, Plotinus, Avicenna, w would you please tell me what is the sound conception of God's unity and simplicity? The Catholic Church has insisted on all of this as its key component of basic orthodoxy. The Fourth Lateran Council's doctrine 
Notice Phaser reads the Fourth Lateran Council's acceptance of Peter Lombard's doctrine of simplicity exactly the way I've said it this whole time. The First Vatican Council as well, it also affirms the Protestant thinkers like Luther and Calvin's doctrine of simplicity. This doctrine of divine simplicity is just simply what we call classical theism. So what he's argued for in this book is a this very same thing that's being refuted in this paper. There is no such thing as classical theism because the rigid designator does not pick out the same God amongst these mutually exclusive systems. It's not a rigid designator. Theism, God, does not tell you. It has no a priori prima facie content. The, the system, the theological system as a whole, is what provides content to the words God, mm -hmm. theism. That's what he's going to argue here in a moment. But I just want to hammer this home that it's not just some academic. This is literally directly. I mean, it's literally refuting exactly what's in Phaser's famous book. And I would add to to, to, to point out that it's not it's not just Roman Catholics. Uh, let me give you an example. I have here the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. This gigantic monstrosity I just got from William, <laughs> William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland, and it starts out in the opening chapter. What is the project of natural theology? Natural theology is the practice of philosophical reflection on the existence and nature of God, of a real or apparent, excuse me, uh, independent, excuse me, independent of divine revelation and scripture. So, we're going to approach questions about God's nature. Think how absurd this is for the Orthodox, given the essence synergy distinction and apophatic mm -hmm. theology. How are you going to approach nature and start determining things about the divine essence? This is absurd. I mean, Paul, there's no similarity according to both Thomism, uh, many of these systems between God's essence, right? Hence the via negativa. And then they turn around and say, oh, but there actually is a comparison between, because all creatures are patterned on reflections of the divine essence. So there's no similarity between creatures and the divine essence. When you start listing what are the properties of the divine essence and what are the properties of creatures, they're opposites, right? God is a perfect unity that is the opposite of the composition and particularity of creatures. God is a perfect eternal stasis that is the opposite of the motion, change, and flux of the created order. God is a perfect unity that is the opposite of the multiplicity of creation. So it's always cast out in opposites, right? That's dialectical philosophy. That's what this philosophy is, is hinging on, is this, 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 these dialectics. But if God is opposite the world, if he is opposite these lists of attributes here for, for, the, for the created realm as opposed to him, then there's no analogia. Now the cause is nothing like its effect, but all the Thomistic predication, natural theology predication is predicated on analogia, analogies. But the thing in category one is totally dissimilar to the thing in category two. Keep, Jay, keep going. I'm just going to grab So it would actually be more consistent to, to adopt the Islamic perspective right? As opposed to the natural theology perspective. Let's give another example of this. Uh, the designator is not working here. That the name God is flaccid. It's a non-rigid designator. And we can see this in scripture. What does the word God refer to in scripture? Well, sometimes it was referring to demons, right? The gods of the nations are devils. Sometimes it's referring to the idols, right? Paul speaks of this in the letters to the Corinthians. Sometimes it's referring to God, Jehovah, or picking out persons of the Trinity. God can pick out the person of the Father, the person of the Son. God can pick out the divine nature. God can pick out the divine actions or attributes. And gods can also be re referring to the good angels, right? The council of the gods, right? The divine council, Elohim. So the word God clearly is not uh, picking out, right? It's not a proper noun. But 
so much of classical theism, generic theism, is predicated on assuming that God is picking out a proper name, namely God the Father, I guess. But guess what? And I was thinking about this because I'm sure people are going to uh, uh, object to, and say something like, well, look, I mean, don't you at least think that Muslims are at least intending to refer to or pick out God the Father when they say God? Uh, no, guess what? They don't believe in God as Father. <laughs> so that actually doesn't work. Muslims are not picking out God as Father because God is not a Father. And for Christians, if you read Athanasius and the Cappadocians, don't they constantly point out that the eternal father presupposes a son? If he's eternally father, then he's eternally father of a son. Okay, well, that's not Muslim. That's mm -hmm. that's a immediate no-no for a Muslim, but that's the immediate step one for an Orthodox Christian. There's no approaching God apart from father, right? Do, do you see the point here? Excellent. So again, just to stress, to, to recapitulate what I'm saying is that natural theology is defined as an autonomous philosophical reflection with no direct appeal to revelation, no interest in going to revelation because that's, in other words, it's presupposing neutrality from the outset. But that's what's in question, right? How do we actually, the fact that you think there's neutrality doesn't mean that there is neutrality. It doesn't... It doesn't mean that things are uh, systemically, uh, that they're not theory laden. Yes. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. All right. Let me share a screen. And we'll go back to the, the nuts and bolts of the logical argument here. Okay. So remember 6TC2, the, the corollary of the theistic position is they want to assume that all the monotheistic religions believe in the same God. Okay. He's going to show what is the problem really in essence with that is that, well, guess what we just showed with the theistic paradox. It can't be established. <laughs> you need that whole list in order to establish 6TC2. But if these are mutually exclusive, you can't establish it. Yeah, but can I bring in a point here? Yes, please. That one of the things that was in the list, uh, so, for example, that he is free, 7B4, mm -hmm. and that he is creator and sustainer, and 7C. I'll pop it back up so everybody can see. So, 7B4 free 7b6 and 7c uh oh wait a minute for god to be person do do we know are we aware of the intense debates uh in the patristic period well i know it's not technically the patristic period it's always the patristic period for the orthodox but you know what i'm saying in the first several centuries so again if we took something like when we say god is person there, there's no, um, like, it can't be divorced from the theological argumentation that went on in that period. So, for example. And he kind of brings that up, doesn't he? He's yeah. Like, we'll for, that alone for now, but, like, that's a big one. 7C, God as a person. What? So, you don't know God as personal apart from Father, Son, and Spirit. That's the only ways that God is person. <laughs> so... What person is Swinburne imagine that he's picking out here? Mm -hmm. Because there's no such thing as generic person. It's got to be the father, son, or spirit. And you see that in the debates with the Cappadocians that they have with uh, Eunomius, right? So there's a whole book, for example, that I'm almost done with, Lucian Terescu's book, Gregor of Nyssa and the concept of hypostasis, divine personhood. Okay, I just mentioned the the Radagawitz book the the Cappadocians for, and the transfer seven hundred dollars uh, the Cappadocians well it's Basil Caesarea Gregor of Nyssa and the transformation of divine simplicity and the book ends it's by point book ends by pointing out that there is no that the Orthodox Church accepts the Cappadocian teaching and not the Augustinian teaching of divine simplicity they have different views the West 
accepted the Augustinian. The Augustinian Western doctrine of divine simplicity, as explicated by later theologians like Peter Lombard, accepted at the Fourth Lateran Council, is what conditions the Roman Catholic doctrine, both of natural theology and of divine simplicity. And it's not acceptable to the Orthodox. And that those, those views are contingent on the unique Orthodox doctrine of the person of the Father being the starting point of our Ordo Theologiae. So in other words, if our Ordo Theologiae begins with the person of the Father, you can't have a Thomistic Ordo Theologiae because it doesn't begin its reasoning with the person of the Father. Thomas does a whole book of reasoning without mentioning any of the, the persons. It's called the Summa Contra Gentiles, Volume 1. The whole book has nothing to do with the Trinity. It's what are all the things that I can know about the unity, the simplicity, the causal role of God, the, per the perfections of God apart from revelation, apart from God as person. So this whole project is a flaw from the outset. Okay, excellent points. Let us return back for more devastating critiques. And again, this is my notes. This isn't actually the article. It's uh, notes that I made on this to make it a bit easier for you all. So again, because of the theistic paradox, you can't establish, the theist cannot establish that the monistic, monotheistic religions believe in the same God. I gotta and he's going to go in. on and say, and it can be effectively disproved. So not only is he saying your argument's bad, you can't get to this. We're going to go through a series of arguments right now that actually disprove their central claim. The first, um, well, he says, because it leads to paradoxical conclusions, the first because the inference, which purports to establish six, i.e. this, six TC, Two, the monotheistic religions believe in the same God, cannot be but fallacious or circular. And second, because of the logical character of belief sentences, that'll be the second argument. In order to show that mono, the premise, their premise, or what they want to conclude, monotheistic religions believe in the same God, cannot be established, let's first, he says, try to construct an argument justifying it. So we're steel manning, okay? We're making the argument for them and then actually going to show that there's a logical fallacy involved in that, and thereby it's fallacious and uh, can be disproven. Okay, he has, here's the first approach. He calls it 8CCF. From the fact that Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and other various ramifications believe that there is one God and only one God, being monotheist, it follows that they believe in the same one God. That is their argument, right? Jay, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. I mean, it right? sounds exactly like, like what Fazer said. Yeah. Exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an obvious example. We're going to substitute. We're going to keep the form of that argument, and then we're going to substitute in terms to actually see that we're making something called a quantifier shift fallacy. So notice this is the exact same argument. Um, every girl is in love with one boy. Therefore, there is one boy every girl is in love with. The theistic argument is, hey, Judaism believes in one and only one God. Christianity believes in one and only one God. Islam believes in one and only one God. Therefore, there is one and only, sorry, for there is one and only one God. Conclusion, therefore, Judaism, Christianity, Islam believe in the same God. That is the quantifier shift fallacy. That's equivalent to say that because every baby has one mother, that therefore every baby um, has only one mother. Yeah. Um, fallacy. And so it doesn't. And then here's his counterexample. Ahmed believes that there's one and only one. He, so he's taking uh, additional counterexamples. This one's from mathematics. 
Ahmed believes that there's only one and only one solution to the, the math bag problem. Isaac believes that there's only one. And... Notice that there, there's like a, an Islamic name, a Jewish name, and a Christian name. <laughs> he actually put in here like three names of the three religions, which is kind yeah, of Yeah, right. Isaac believes that there's one and only one solution to the problem. John believes there's one and only one solution to the mathematics problem. There is only one and only one solution to the problem. Does it follow that Ahmed, Isaac, and John believe in the same solution to the problem? How do people not see that this is obviously a fallacy? And this is just so clear. I mean, we've been making these arguments for so many years, but he has put it into a formal way that is just like, I mean, come on, dude. This is obvious, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So all of those are arguments to show going back to what we said that um, they cannot establish their claim that monotheistic religions believe in the same God. Now let's actually disprove it. <clears throat> um, and this is where we're going to get into the semantical um, issues that uh, basically because of the logical character of belief statements, in rigid versus proper names, rigid designators versus non-rigid or flaccid designators, there's a fundamental error that's going to occur, and we can show this. If the God is the theist wants is a there's a common core, and therefore the common core designates by the name God a proper name, meaning that applies in every possible world. Then there's an identity. There's a logical identity between God. All the other stuff is just like superfluous accidental stuff. If that's true, then we can substitute that term. If it's a proper name as the theist wants, if it's a rigid designator, then because it's an, a logical identity, then I could substitute this. But let's see how this actually can't work. Let's assume the theist is correct and God is a proper name and i.e. a rigid designator, meaning that 6TC2 is true. The monotheistic religions believe in the same God. Then notice this, true premise, true premise, false conclusion. So it's a good argument, um, but obviously we, we made a mistake because it's not in the structure of the argument. Aristotle believed in God, true. God is Trinity, true. Therefore, Aristotle believed in the Trinity. Oh, there you go. There's, there's nothing that wrong simple. with the, the structure of this argument. And a valid deductive argument says that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. But the conclusion's false. So what went wrong? What went wrong is actually that you cannot have the substitutability of these terms because guess what they mean something different they're not rigid designators they mean something different in the religion or paradigm or philosophy of aristotle versus the christian paradigm and therefore they're not rigid designators and if they're not rigid designators therefore the monotheistic religions do not believe in the same god um, this is also by uh, you abilities known as the hooded man paradox. Same thing. It's going to illustrate in which a logical and semantic um, belief sentences actually make a difference when it comes to identity, uh, uh, identity and substitutability. Premise one, John does not know the hooded man coming. Premise two, the hooded man coming is John's father. So we could assume those are both true. And you'd have to get to a conclusion that if you have, if you actually don't, if you think that these names always, or if, let's put it another way. If you ignore the logical content and, uh, about beliefs sentences 
then you'd have to conclude that John does not know and does know his father. So what this demonstrates, both cases, the Aristotle believing in the Trinity and uh, Eubilides hooded man paradox is what we call, take note of this, the non-substitutivity of identicals in epistemic, right? This is the knowing, epistemic, or intentional context, intentional, that within the paradigm, there's an intention that hits a certain God that's very different than in Christianity. And if you ignore that, then you're going to be led to false conclusions from good arguments. So nothing wrong with the argument. So where's the problem? The problem must be, I'm not paying attention to this principle here about how semantic and epistemic context will actually determine whether something's a rigid or flaccid designator. Sound good so far? Yeah, can I interject? Yes. So a couple points here is that again, we remember that, and he, uh, the, he even uses uh, er, a little bit earlier um, Aristotle as an example. Aristotle's God is not uh, the equivalent of Christian theism. So Aristotle's God is thought, thinking itself. He is not personal. Uh, he has an eternal other than himself, the created world that he eternally actualizes and moves. That's not our God. There's no eternal complement dyad to God. St. Basil goes after this whole conception of theism in Hexameron 2 and calls it stupid and foolishness, right? And he says it's a dyad. Well, our God is not a dyad. So I don't know where this, this idea that there's just that because there's a few things that match up, therefore the same referent is easy to refute, as we're actually going to see here in a little bit. But notice that uh, how arbitrary, for example, uh, the list of classical theists were for um, Phaser, right? Phaser had these, these lists of people, but wait a minute. Do the deists count? What about the pantheists? What about Satanists? What about a, Satan, a Satanist who thinks that Satan is the one true God? Do you see how arbitrary and absurd it is? So in other words, that shows that there's not a generic theism that we can know just on the basis of the word God, theism, etc. Because Aristotle's God is not our God at a very fundamental level. Deists are not our in the same camp as us just because they profess theism any more than deists are, are identical to pantheists because they both are quote theists. So it becomes evident that the mutually the mutual exclusivity of these systems shows that they can't find. Uh, neutral ground upon which they can be on common, have a common core, so to speak. And he actually uses that term common core. So this gives us, again, the proves the premise, the, 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 the principle that God or theism are theory laden terms. Later on in this paper, he will go into the conceptual content behind the terms. Well, the words God, the word God and the word theism are going to be systemically determined. They're going to be theory laden. The systems will tell you what those terms mean, and there's no non-systemic, non-theory-laden content or value to those words. But notice that classical theism's classical foundationalism, the idea that there are neutral, theory-neutral, non-theory-laden, content, uh, self-evident content, right, words phrases terms principles right that's presupposed in this system but that's the very thing that's in question yeah so that's what all those examples were supposed to show is right that. and what's the problem that we've always critiqued with natural theology it's just kind of evidentialism right yes you just start from this stuff and that things aren't actually theory contaminating paradigm relative what what he was able to do the author of this article is to show that take that line of reasoning and you're actually going to ignore um, the idea that belief paradigms and are contaminated and that belief contents and epistemic identifications are going to be determined by what one knows or believes in terms of the whole such that you cannot do an interchangeability of those simply based on the word. 
Okay, it's it's a fancy logical way of saying um, what we've always said, Jay. The word concept fallacy. It's just taking it at, yeah. at, at a deeper level. It's equivocation. Yeah. That um, and he derives this principle in epistemic or intentional context. Okay, what intentional doesn't mean I have a desire, but that my beliefs are directed about right the sense and meaning has a referent. Okay, that's within a context and it's determined. So in epistemic or intentional context, identicals cannot be replaced salva veritate. They have to, you have to take in account of the rules of the paradigm that determines the sense and reference. Yeah, so- Therefore, yeah. Mm, go. Uh, you had uh, a few examples of, of how that quantifier shift fallacy uh, can be explicated. We, we heard the one about the boy, the girls, the loving of one boy. And you said uh, that every effect has a cause. Therefore, all effects have the same cause. So we reason from the fact that each effect has a cause to the invalid conclusion that, oh, there's well, only one because then there's the only one cause for, yeah, every baby has one mother. Therefore, every baby has the one and same mother. And my PhD, I told you, my PhD advisor, uh, James O'Shea, who, um, I'll plug his book right there, who's a Kantian scholar and uh, wrote this book on Richard Sellers. He gave me that argument all the way back in grad school. And I didn't really understand it because I was too caught up in natural theology and Thomism and Aristotelian arguments to understand that what he was saying and here all along he was right it's the quantifier shift fallacy that he was and he was critiquing Aquinas's arguments and these cosmological arguments he's like that doesn't follow yeah I exactly and, and and the the same argument even though we're not right at this point talking about the, the causation and cosmological argument the same fallacy is being identified in the claim that uh, all three religions believe in monotheism, therefore they believe in the same God. That's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Where should we go? Um, let me give my example. Remember my example? Yeah, Jay had a great example. So I, I was thinking of a way to sort of um, illustrate that even if a person thinks that, oh, well, we both have the same end goal right we're both intending the same referent we're, we're both if even if we're picking out the same thing it still isn't going to work because for example imagine i said that i be, i believe that there's buried treasure in in the promised land and uh i find another friend oh yes i believe that there's buried treasure in the promised land too and so we both have the same belief and we both have read uh you know about how to go find treasure. We, we both have ideas. And I say to my friend, how are you going to go about getting the, uh, the treasure buried in the promised land? And he says, well, uh, let me tell you, I'm going to uh, book a flight right now. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to, when I get to Israel, I'm going to, you know, buy a plot of land where I think it is. And we've got a team and we're going to excavate. And, and I said, whoa, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I, I, going to promised land which is a christian bookstore down the road from me and i know the owner's granddad and he buried his uh you know stolen bank money underneath the basement in a vault so we both had the same belief we both had the same words totally different referent and totally different ways of what was in our head right about getting to the end result there so the fact that we have similar even phrases and particular names, right? Promised land in this case was at least intended to pick out a specific uh, referent. It's, it was intended to be even a rigid designator. When we actually look at this example, we see that it was two totally different intentions and two totally different mutually exclusive, right? End results, goals, things that we were trying to do, even though on the surface they appear to be, oh, we're both gonna go get the buried treasure in the promised land. So point you being, can even have a, a common, quote unquote, list of properties. Um, 
it's a place that where there's a, a, a lot of rich history about Christianity. Um, it's uh, religious people hang out there. They go to a pil- hang out yeah, they, they make big journeys to get there. <laughs> right. Um, they even take charitable donations. Right. Um, but it ends up you're not hitting the referent. Yeah, yeah, it's like cool. it's like the word cat. Okay. I mean what is cat picking out? Sure. Cat is not necessarily picking out that cat, right? When it's that cat, right? Spot. I know spot's a dog name, but so in other words, the word God is no different than the word cat, right? In the sense that it's mm-hmm. just picking out one of a class of different things that when you stepped away, we were looking at the biblical examples of God and the word, you know, refers to demons. It refers to idols. It refers to angels. It refers to Yahweh. And even humans are called God will make you a God to Pharaoh. So the word again is, as you said, non-rigid, flaccid designator. Uh, And so how do we know what it's picking out then? That's precisely where the system is what gives the content, the conceptual content to the word God, what we are picking out. Oh, I am picking out as an Orthodox Christian, what's in the creed. And the professor in the, in the paper will even say, when Christians say the word God, they mean the Nicene Creed, Trinity. When Muslims say the word God, they mean the Shahada, right? That Allah is the perfect, you know, soul, Unity, whatever. Yeah, that was an excellent point, too. Um, okay, should we go on? Uh, yeah, I thought the... Um, I know we're past this, but the... So, he actually kind of elucidated the fact that natural theology's attempt to disprove or to dispense with revelation is precisely what brings about the failure. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Thus, generic. That's, that was ge- my point about yeah. the, the Hicks, Hicks stuff. Right. And let's see the disaster. What I thought was the disastrous example, uh, or excuse me, devastating example was the one, uh, we already passed that, the Ahmed, uh, the three different people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've done that part. That it's systemic dependent. We've done that. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to catch up to because I had notes on each page in the in the margins. So, so going. Back oh, oh, oh! There was another example he gave. Natural theology, generic theism, is like saying religion is true, right? It's really a meaningless phrase because when the Muslim says religion is true. When you ask him what he means, right, it's not Christianity. He doesn't think that the Christian is practicing true religion. Right? Are you listening? Yeah. I I think, yeah, exactly. He's spot on with the... And that's that's why he got to the non-substitutivity of identicals, uh, right? That that principle, like, really disproves any of these attempts. So I wrote that the crux here was um, uh, what is at the bottom of page 12. Could you pull, are you there? Is that where you are? I am on, okay, I was on 13. I just pulled up at the bottom of page 12. Yep, I'm there. Because that's the point I left off on is the 14 NSI. So in epistemic or intentional context, identities cannot be replaced. Salva Veritate. Now we can establish the conclusion that any epistemic argument is fundamentally flawed, which assumes the interchangeability of the belief contents without explicit epistemic identifications. The theist argument cannot be constructed, therefore, with the help of unspecified belief sentences supplemented with non-epistemic premise. Such since such an argument would violate the principle of the non-substitutivity of identicals. In other words, exactly what we said, you cannot take an evidentialist approach and therefore from there do natural theology and think that you can prove God 
or that God means the same thing, um, or we worship the same God and uh, various religions. Um, yes, and then it's so all paradigm relative as far as um, determining its semantical content or whether it's rigidity designating something an entity or not that could be substituted can't be substituted. Therefore, their argument fails. So this is the first argument he gave is they can't establish the theist corollary that we all believe. That yeah, was the first one I gave. The exactly. second one was, it's refuted. This is the argument, refutes it. Like, it's destroyed now. Completely. Yeah, Averroes believes in God. Averroes believes that God, uh, excuse me, uh, Averroes believes in God, therefore Averroes believes in the Trinity. Yeah, because God is the Trinity, then you could substitute in them, but you can't, we know that. Um, therefore, their argument is false. So they have no arguments for and the argument that would prove it was just destroyed by the principle of non-substitutivity of identical non-substitutive identicals and epistemic essential context um okay let's go on and he goes on to talk about Core doctrine and the additions. Yeah. So Islam, Shahada versus the Nicene Creed. Three pairs, gonna... sh yeah. Share, let's see, that is on page 15. Now, so l let me just summarize what we just did. Three phase share a number of similar doctrines because this is going to be your transitional thought into the next section. Three phase share a number of similar doctrines. Indeed, for example, that God created the universe, that there is providence, and that there is a last judgment in some form. This does not justify, however, the assumption of the core doctrine of three religions. Generally speaking, sharing certain properties does not imply that these shared properties are core properties. That certain things happen to fly does not necessarily imply that flying is their core property. One flying thing might be a bird. Mm -hmm. Another an airplane, while well, third a bat or a plastic bag blown by the wind. Great argument. Okay, so let's look at conjuncts and truth values. And because now that we see that a paradigm of religion, what the the meaning the semantics of the term god is defined by the rules of all the properties of that religion they lay that out such that it gives a unique so now that we know it's not interchangeable let's look at what he's actually saying about conjuncts and truth values now for example what he means by conjunct i could say um, I'm trying to think of a logic example. Um, to say that A and B, those are going to have two separate truth values. It could be true, false. However, to say A and B brackets has one truth value. In other words, that's what we're going to get to here is, are they just separate interchangeable properties, additions that you can add on, or are they taken together as a conjunct? Because that's going to make a difference. And the fact that you add other things on there is going to actually change the truth values as well. Um, I'll just say this real quick because this was kind of a summary. The meaning of the term God cannot be established independently from a religion, i.e. a paradigm, that is independently of the context of the rules and instructions in which it is used. In fact, God is defined by a particular body of textual, liturgical... Yeah, the, the paradigm, exactly, right. Yeah, in legal and aesthetical use. Isn't this everything we said? Bestowed by a tradition and not the other way around. What's the other way around? Ground up evidentialism. Yeah, so God and the theism mm -hmm. are theory-laden terms... And the conceptual content for those comes from the system as a whole. So there's no, again, non-theory laden idea of what God is. The content of the terms is defined by the systems. 
God has no conceptual content out of that context. Con context. And to see this, all you need to do is realize that Allah is not Father and Son. So that's something exclusionary to who God is in the Islamic system, but it's fundamental to who God is in the Christian system. Hence why we believe in the Nicene Creed. I mean, it's, it's really obvious when you think about this, right? And the systems are mutually exclusive, right? That's the, really the whole point of page 14, which is a really a crucial crux page, right? Yeah, okay. Um... By the way, I um, want to go ahead and take the Super Chats and call it. I mean, we, we're kind of past halfway, so. Yeah, that's fine. I apologize. I lost it's okay. I mean, we've been going for over two hours, but uh, we don't want to. You guys feel educated? <laughs> I think we've uh, thinned the herd down to only the most uh, interested people here. I don't know, which is good, seven, actually. We got rid. We got rid of. We, we had to ban like yeah. twenty just idi idiots tonight already. So, um, yep. Okay. So. Let's get to the super chats here. And I'll have to add, by the way, I know that there's actually a lot of flaccid designated people in this audience and <laughs> chalk.com would be a huge advantage for uh, those that uh, married people who uh, are having issues with um, low T uh, chalk.com actually has been proven uh, right to boost T uh, the, the, you, you know what I mean by the T. Uh, so we're actually fighting right the soyification we're actually promoting um we we literally want to want to make you and, toxic masculine we want to make you determined that will be determined by the context of your supplements we want to make you into the toxic masculine so <clears throat> um if you're looking for like ways to be clear-minded ways to like optimize your health um this is this is the kind of thing that you want so again I, you guys know i take Seven Wonders, I take long, uh, the, <clears throat> I take the Tongcat, which is full of the long jack, if you know what I mean. I take Chalk Daily. So all three of these, actually, you get a good deal if you um, use the promo code J that I put into the chat there for you guys. And hey, they're like super base dudes that just got zucked, right? So they had a huge platform that got removed. Uh, from Instagram and you know they, they've been longtime supporters of Jay's analysis now they're like literally one of our official uh, we're, we're branded you guys we're branded this is like legit e-celeb status here so if you yeah, guys want next level. Yeah. exactly so um, go over and uh, support those guys uh, you can actually order like the recurring subscription service stuff too so if you want the supplements to come on a regular basis then use the promo code j uh i think it's j80 is the new code right now where you get like 80 percent off if you want to do the recurring um i'm actually gonna uh step out of the box in the next couple of days and check out some of the other supplements because i actually have everything <laughs> i have all of their stuff but because uh, I haven't really experimented with the She Legit yet, so I want to check that out. Um, but these other supplements are legit. They're for real. Like, I've really noticed a lot more energy. I've noticed a lot more virility, um, which I wasn't even lacking. So it's like to the extreme. So anyway, shout out to Chalk.com and definitely step over there if you if you guys would and um, get your supplements and if you're watching this later you can i'll have the promo codes uh in the show description as well down below uh so father you can go ahead with what you were gonna say let's take super chats all right uh mikhail the king of kings for five dollars thank you god bless you father deacon and jay dyer well thank you i much appreciate the palantir since five bucks and he says hey guys i have a question question if the orthodox conception of hell is not so much a place one is sent to but rather the inner state of the soul to the reality of god how are we then to make sense of christ's descent into hades so it is a place that we are it sent to but hades is destroyed in the descent of christ into into hades so hades is not where people are going hades is a place that's transformed and what happens in the eschaton is that it's the presence of God that is what is the torment to the wicked. So 
Um, Hades is transformed, but that doesn't mean that there's no place because the wicked are resurrected. So they still have a, they're still in a place, but that place, wherever that is, is not away from the presence of God. It's actually the presence of God that is ever ill being to them. And I think that also like in the, the sacred space of the church building within the context of the liturgy to the space the physical locale and and location and space has a real spiritual and theological significance. So I don't see them mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, we talk about the New Jerusalem. I've been to Jerusalem, and that there's the gates, right? The gates of New, you know, of Jerusalem, in which the faithful are protected. <coughs> um, and then there's the outside, and right outside the gates is the uh is gehenna the trash heap which is like uh like a valley and i think that that'll continue that the, a literal actually place will continue in the next life and after the final judgment that the gates of new jerusalem will be open and god's presence will be everywhere but there will be people that are out and within but all experiencing so i i don't think there's this dialectics that it's like oh it's just a state i still think there's an importance yeah well the, w- the wicked are resurrected place. in bodies so yeah yep mm-hmm. all right palantir says I don't, it'll, I don't know if it'll look exactly like how it is in jerusalem but i imagine that same physical kind of description will will be in the eschaton too that the there will be the gates of the new jerusalem and those outside of it and the gates are opened as it describes in revelation meaning they could come in but given their own state they can't they don't want to because of how they solidified themselves yeah well that gets into his next question which he says palantir says since everybody has a body in the eschat in the world to come how come the damned are unable to repent in the eschaton? Well, repentance requires grace, and the damned do not get grace in the eschaton. So their nature is restored, but they're not participating in divine life. So the fact that they have a body um, and the fact that they still possess, in some sense, a will does not mean that they will be able to will and choose the good. Uh, in this, It's similar to the way that the, the wicked angels, they possess a will, but they're not able to will the good anymore because they confirm themselves in the perpetual choice of evil. So the wicked will not be able to choose the good. They will just consistently be willing evil. Um, I've heard the argument that the wicked cannot act out of their repentance, but why is that the case if they have new bodies? Well, uh, repentance is not conditioned just on having a body. So it requires not just a will, but also grace. And the wicked don't get grace. Palantir says again for $5. The final uh, question for me today. I know that one's soul and hypostasis are different things, right? So persons have souls. They're not identical to souls. Um, I am struggling to distinguish them. Well, so body and soul are faculties of human nature. Uh, They're properties, right? body soul mind will those are things that make up what it is to be human but they're not instantiated uh without some person having them so they they are uh in hypostatized those those features or traits of nature exist in the mode of the persons that have them so that's why you can't reduce a person to any nature or trait just like in the trinity you can't reduce the persons to the nature or trait uh, of, of the Godhead or of the divine attributes, right? The, the spirit is not reducible to love. The son is not reducible to, you know, some attribute, uh, will or, or property, right? You can't say the son is the will of the father, right? You can say it in the sense of manifestation, which Athanasius does. He says the son is the reason of the father, but that's is of manifestation, not is of strict identity. So, um, so in the same way, if we make um, traits or features of nature, what is the definition of person? That's the heresy of Apollinarianism. Because mm-hmm. Apollinaris said that human nature is, was essentially the mind, reason. 
And since he wanted to combat Nestorianism, he wanted to remove the possibility of Christ being a human person. So what did he do? He replaced the human, uh, he replaced the human reasoning faculty in Christ with the Logos. So he's a divine person, right? According to Apollinaris, who lacks human reasoning. Why? Because human reasoning is what it is to be a human person. That's not true. We're not Apollinarians. We don't believe that. So the re refutation of Apollinarianism is precisely predicated on the distinction between nature and person. So the faculties, the properties, the components of what it is to have human nature, body, mind, soul, will, right? is not, none of those are reducible to the human person because the human person has those things, you see. Hence, Christ assumes universal human nature as the fathers teach, thus the recapitulation. So you said, what is the distinction between a sinful soul and a sinful person, right? Well, that's ways to describe things that a person has or does. It's not a... Uh, description of identity. This is a distinction between the is of predication and the is of identity. The dog is brown, right? That's not the is of identity. That's the is of predication. So do the dog is brown. That doesn't mean that the dog is literally the color brown. The dog has brown as an instance. It's that simple. Bantu, $2. Is it possible to construct your own religion with generic theism? And if that's the case, why don't I just start my own cult and make money? Generic theism is built on human reasoning, and that's why it will always fail. God be with you, Jay and Father Deacon. Yes, it that's is. funny. That's the next argument. Right? It is the third, precisely. The third religion argument. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Orthodoxy chloroquine, $25. Why did the West ignore the fundamental teaching of the Cappadocian Fathers concerning their rejection of absolute divine simplicity and the affirmation of the essence, energy, person, nature distinction, uh, and then turn around and claim that they actually taught Thomism all along. This is absurd. Well, the West at the time didn't reject the Cappadocians. In fact, the ecumenical councils, especially you could say that it's implied in the in uh, Constantinople one accepting the Cappadocians that Im implicitly thus they are accepting the essence energy distinction of the Cappadocians. You could say that it's implied in Ephesus because Ephesus accepts St. Cyril's teachings on the whole pretty much and saint cyril clearly in many many passages teaches the essence energy distinction explicitly you could say that chalcedon implicitly also teaches the essence energy distinction even though it's not explicit in the acceptance of the previous councils and you could say that uh the fifth council accepting the leontii or particularly uh, uh saint leontis of jerusalem's teaching of inhopostasis uh that that's an implicit acceptance of the energies as well uh, because the sixth council refers back to the fifth council when it teaches two wills and two energies in Christ. So it, really, if you know the literature, if you know the patristic teaching, then you realize that uh, ecumenical councils two, three, four, five, six, all pretty much teach the essence energy distinction. And the West accepting those things is kind of default accepting those things too. So what happens though is that after many centuries in the West, the West goes in a different direction, eventually accepting more and more Augustinian assumptions and conclusions, such as Filioque, then you have the disputes at the time of St. Photius, then you have the full break in 1054, and then you get ultimately, it's, there's not the, the, the crystal clear ideas of the two different churches is Council of Lyon, and Florence versus the Palamite Synods. That's where it's crystal clear that we're both totally different and both reject each other. The Orthodox Palamite Synods reject Rome. St. Gregory of Palamas says Rome is apostate. Rome is, her is heretical. Rome is heterodox. He says they listen to Satan. Okay. The Palamite Synods accept his teaching, just like Ephesus accepts Cyril's teaching. Okay. So it's the same principle, same approach. Therefore, we can't say that well you know let's let's we, we if we just have a lot of academics get together they can figure out a way to smush uh you know florence and saint gregory palamas together doesn't work so they're mutually exclusive you see you see how this applies to the theology too mutual exclusivity anyway it is absurd uh orthodoxy chloroquine 25 dollars again says 
I uh, watched your video on the debate between St. Gregory Palamas and Barleon. Bar it's beyond comedy how Roman Catholics and, and, its, and its progeny Protestantism are collapsing before our very eyes, and we watch Orthodoxy vindicated as the saints warned us a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. St. Gregory Palamas says to Barleon, if you accept your divine simplicity, created grace teachings, the West will go into atheism. It's exactly what happened. Exactly. Uh, Father, you dig any comments before I move on? No, go ahead. Orthodox Prepper, $7. Questions and concepts that often come, uh, come up from New Agers. Do our thoughts create reality? Does truth come from within? What is your take on New Age spirituality? Thank you, Jay and Father Deacon. I'll let you answer those. First one, do our thought, how would you reply to a New Ager, Father Deacon, who said, or asked you, do our thoughts create reality and does truth come from within? I would turn them to, where's my book? Thoughts Determine Our Lives. Remember that book? Is that one of the elders? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I gotta be better organized with my books. Elder Thaddeus. I knew it. Told you it was one of the elders. Elder Thaddeus. Um, oh, here it is. I found it. All the wisdom the <laughs> is in you. those two books. <laughs> Everything you need. Okay, but the, but you. but the the way in which Elder Thaddeus says our thoughts determine our lives is not the same way that New Age. No, <laughs> New Agers not. New Agers believe that your mind is God and it literally makes the, the external world. Exactly, um, and so no and. You know, part of that is this whole temptation that you are God. Exactly. Uh, so so it's, it's demonic in origin. Exactly. Does truth come from within? No, it comes from without, yes. which then allows you to see what's truly within, right? The truth that is within you. But you have to be purified. You have to have your mind illuminated. You have to um, repent before you can return to the inward and see the truth inside you. There's a mm -hmm. cleansing process that has to occur. This is why the, the fathers speak of what's the, you know, the, the uh, purification, uh, illumination, and deification. So that's the process of, of every saint. Okay, what was the other part of the, or those were the two questions? What would be your general take on then New Age spirituality? Um... Well, I think it's it's destructive, obviously, and uh, it takes us. There's nothing new about New Age. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> they they come from these, you know, uh, these other kind of religions about um, that's that's either you know kind of monistic or dualistic, um, and ultimately are self-destructive, both epistemologically and in terms of uh, one's life. Exactly. Pano says for $5, chalk will get rid of all your flaccid designators. Exactly. You read my mind. So we, we're we on the same, me and uh, Pano are on the same wavelength. We, we're even making the same jokes now. This is crazy. Yeah. Uh, Mardi Gras Q, $10. So thank you, Mardi Gras Q, for $10. Um, if you want the second half of this, of course, you can subscribe at Jay's Analysis. And in the next couple days, it won't be tonight, uh, Father Deacon and I will do the part two, and then I'll get that up for you guys. But everybody always asks immediately after the first half, where's part two? I don't do it right away. It usually takes a day or two. So um, I've been behind, as you guys know, on the part twos for everybody and the website because of the website troubles last week. I think most of that's fixed. Um, it had to do with uh, incompatible plugins after two or three updates. This happens about once a year on the website, so sorry for that. But hopefully it'll be ironed out pretty soon. Um, the shop is down precisely because of the incompatibility of the plugins. So whenever the uh, people who write the code, when they correctly update their plugins, I have to wait until they do that before it will. I can turn it back on and it will work. Otherwise, the whole site collapses. So... Um, everybody be sure to uh, subscribe to Father Deacon. Um, I'm going to add the links to Patristic Faith, uh, which, again, is the new project, if you didn't hear at the beginning. And uh, thank you guys so much for the super chats. I will be sharing those with Father Deacon. 
And then, uh, you know, if you want, if you want to hear the second half of this, it's going to be killer. Uh, subscribe to Jay's analysis. And, uh, you know, we're not going to lay all of our cards on the table. We can't lay everything out because we do have the big debate coming up in a few weeks mm -hmm. uh, on this topic with Trent. So look forward to that. And anything else you want to leave anybody with? I know you've been putting up some really good lectures and talks, Father Deacon. Yeah, I'm just going to continue to do that. That um, introduction to philosophy, uh, ethics. I have other ones too, some logic lectures. I've got the political philosophy. And I'll do, you know, Jay's model has been so successful. And yes, I too um, have to support my family. And so I, I give a free half. And then a second uh, for much, you know, as compared to what the logic lectures are supposed to charge, these are much more affordable. I'm trying to make it more affordable while at the same time um, trying to support my family and have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> so, more of those. I've got tons of them recorded. I'm just kind of just going through the editing, packaging those so that they're the best kind of quality audio video that you can get for your money. So, um, you can find my materials on Facebook or my Gumroad account, which is in the links to my videos. Yeah, and I've been watching those. Uh, Jamie and I watched your uh, introduction to ethics. That was a really fun class. And then um, the uh, interview that you did with Lewis the other day on Orthodox Epistemology was great. So I want to encourage everybody to go watch those for sure. Um, we got another super chat from children. We are the children of the soy. Open mouths in the air. If you don't know that uh, Children of the Sun song by Dead Can Dance. So I think he's uh, doing I think he's doing a play on Children of the Sun from Dead Can Dance, but he did Children of the Soy. So thank you for that super chat there, <laughs> Children of the Soy. Much appreciated. Uh, everybody go listen to Dead Can Dance and you'll hear you'll know what I'm talking about. But um yeah i think that's it for tonight and uh hopefully i can get you to come back in the next um in the next couple days and then since we did a lot of this essay let's do the last part of it and then maybe you and i can do a little bit of chatting for the uh subscribers yes. uh in a couple chapters of this book let's do it okay excellent thank you father deacon and everybody